In order to explore consciousness, we first need to define what we mean by this term. The word consciousness is used in two different but related ways. The first is consciousness as the sum total of mental states that are subjectively perceived. All of your thoughts, emotions, and perceptions form your consciousness, and this consciousness disappears when you get knocked out, are under anesthesia, or in deep sleep. The exception to this last example is when you are dreaming, because you are still subjectively experiencing something when you are in a dream. Essentially, this definition encompasses anything which is subjectively experienced by your mind, and the fundamental elements of this are called qualia. From now on, we will refer to this as the psyche. The second definition of consciousness, which we commonly use, is synonymous with awareness. For example, you are conscious of the fact that you are watching a video, and now you are conscious of the fact that you are breathing, and now you are aware of your feet touching the ground. Notice that your mind can perceive many things at once, such as the temperature of the room, the sound of my voice, or the images on the screen, but you are only consciously aware of a limited number of things at any given time, and to be conscious of something else means to become unconscious of whatever it is that you were originally conscious of. In this sense, consciousness is almost like a spotlight that our minds can use whenever we know or understand or are aware of something. Another way to demonstrate what I mean by consciousness is to think what happens as you drive. Normally as we are driving, we are not conscious of our steering or applying the brakes or gas. Most of the time, our thoughts are elsewhere. We only need to be conscious of driving if something unexpected occurs, like when an ambulance comes up from behind. This difference is also clear if you think about dreams. In dreams, although we are experiencing something, we only experience it unconsciously, and it is only when we have a lucid dream that we are conscious during a dream. This video is about this second definition of consciousness, which is sometimes also called metaconsciousness, or simply cognition. This phenomenon is arguably less mysterious than consciousness in the broader sense, but it is still rather astounding. Think about it. Consciousness is our ability to know things. How is it possible to know anything at all? Like for example, knowing what is currently behind you without actually looking at it, or knowing facts, like that 3 minus 4 equals negative 1, or that this is a wonderpus photogenicus. And furthermore, it seems that the more we know, the more power we have to manipulate our environments. Understanding how magnets work was a key development in the invention of cars for example, and understanding gravity made it possible to send people to the moon. The fact that our minds can approach the natural world in this way and wrap our minds around it is truly fascinating. It is so fascinating that Martin Heidegger called beings that are capable of this Dasein, and this is one of the ways in which humans greatly differ from most other animals. This sense of consciousness is extremely important, and we can utilize the fact of consciousness strategically. Becoming conscious of something, either a general fact or of something specific to your life, increases your ability to manipulate your environment and a higher consciousness allows us to see the world with ever-increasing complexity, noticing things to which you were previously oblivious. And furthermore, we can interpret the world in various ways, drawing different types of information based on the interpretation we use. Therefore, you can use the insights of this video in order to elevate your consciousness and use this fact to your advantage. Various thinkers have attempted to elucidate the nature of consciousness. Nietzsche, for example, wrote the following. It is through recognizing that we come to have the feeling that we already know something. Thus, it means combating a feeling of newness and transforming the apparently new into something old. Nietzsche suggests here that at its root, consciousness is transforming something unknown into something already known in order to produce a feeling of familiarity with the new experience. Jung suggests a similar idea. We speak of knowing something when we succeed in linking a new perception to an already established context in such a way that we hold in consciousness not only the new perception, but this context as well. Both Jung and Nietzsche suggest that consciousness is using a familiar idea to elucidate something new, but Julian Jaynes took this logic further and suggested that consciousness has precisely the same roots as language. This makes sense if you think about it, because as I speak these words, you have a sense that you understand them, that you are conscious of the meaning of these words. This sense of understanding is directly related to the feeling of conscious awareness. According to Jaynes, the fundamental fact which makes language understandable is metaphor. This may sound strange because when we think of metaphorical language, we may think of poetry, but in fact, even basic linguistic understanding depends on metaphors. It is through metaphors that we familiarize ourselves with any new idea. Take the word familiar for example. 
What does it mean to become familiar with something? It means to familiarize ourselves with it. But the roots of the word familiar is related to the Latin word familia, which means our household. The idea of your family is being used as a metaphor to mean something to which we have grown accustomed to, that we know intimately, i.e. like those with whom we are familiar. Essentially, a metaphor takes a concept which we already know and uses it to illuminate something which we are trying to know because of a similarity between them. This is how words are linked to meanings, as Ian McGilchrist writes, Metaphoric thinking is fundamental to understanding the world, because it is the only way in which understanding can reach outside the system of signs to life itself. It is what links language to life. We can therefore divide a metaphor into two parts, which James calls the metafire, or the idea we already know, and the metafriend, the new idea which becomes illuminated through comparison with the metafire. Once you begin to notice this, you will see that all language is metaphorical. For example, when I said that the metafire illuminates the metafriend, I am using the metafire of illumination with light to understand the metafriend, which is of consciousness. Thus, illumination is a metaphor for consciousness, and this works because there is some similarity between light and consciousness, and so the idea of light helps us to understand the idea of consciousness. Studying etymology reveals that grabbing with the hands is commonly used as a metaphor for understanding such as when we say that we have grasped something, or that we comprehend it, since this derives from the Latin prehendere, which also means to seize with the hands. This makes sense, because when we see something, we can pin it down and take possession of it, and this is similar to understanding. The body, since it is so familiar, is often used as a metaphor when we speak, for instance, about the legs of a table, or the arms of a clock, or the face of a cliff. Notice that metaphors always start as things we commonly experience, such as grabbing things or parts of our body, and we extend these concrete, real metaphors to mean metaphorical things in order to speak about abstract concepts. For example, if I say the answer is queer, I use the literal idea of clarity and apply it in a new context, and this reveals something about the answer in question. There is a feeling of similarity between the literal meaning and the way it is being used metaphorically. Words for understanding are all like this, not just grasping and comprehending, but also words like discover, which implies that whatever it is we discover starts out covered, and then we uncover it. You can see clearly how the idea of something being covered and then revealed is a metaphor for the more abstract principle of discovery, and the veal part of the word reveal means veiled, i.e. the idea is that something is being veiled and that we are unveiling it. This is how human understanding proceeds. We construct metaphors from our actual experiences in the real world in order to mentally approach more abstract concepts, and this produces the feeling that we know what something means. We may observe something like a river flowing, and use this as a metaphor for being able to speak, as when we speak fluently. All metaphors start with observations of the real world, which are then used to make sense of phenomena which are less easily approachable. This is how all understanding works. As John Lakoff wrote, Metaphor is centrally a matter of thought, not just words. Metaphorical language is a reflection of metaphorical thought. Eliminating metaphor would eliminate philosophy. Without a very large range of conceptual metaphors, philosophy could not get off the ground. The metaphoric character of philosophy is not unique to philosophic thought. It is true of all abstract human thought, especially science. Conceptual metaphor is what makes most abstract thought possible. Just to hammer the point home one more time, notice that the word reflection, which literally has to do with mirrors, can be used metaphorically here in a related sense. This is why we can make sense of a phrase, like that the business could not get off the ground. We understand what this means, even though businesses aren't literal objects that are at risk of levitating. This phrase is meaningful, because we can abstract certain ideas associated with the idea of leaving the ground, and apply it in a new context as a metaphor for success where it takes on a new but related meaning. Notice as well that the literal meaning, the getting off the ground part, is not lost, but rather, it forms our bridge towards an understanding of the phrase. Notice also the phrase forming a bridge. It too is something concrete, and is used to generate a new meaning, that of a gap being closed. Another example would be the expression that we are all on the same page. You know what this means, but that feeling you know what it means comes from the fact that its literal meaning, pages on a book, produces a new meaning when used in a different context, but this new meaning is still related, via metaphor, to the literal meaning. 
Metaphorical extension is the mechanism through which we can extend our consciousness infinitely, but we can understand this process better when we think about the nature of words. Words fundamentally codify information so that they are more retrievable. The word existentialism probably evokes various ideas in your mind, which you, based on your own experience, associate with the idea of existentialism, but notice that these ideas generally stay in the back of your mind, subtly informing how you interpret the word. This complicated concept can be codified so that it is easier to refer to, but you implicitly know that the idea has a deeper meaning, which remains unconscious. The same goes for the names of countries. If I say France, this is a short form for what is actually a very multifaceted idea, but the ideas you associate with France are not at the forefront of your mind, unless you deliberately bring them to mind. Or even yourself. Your name is associated with a myriad number of ideas which you associate with yourself, but which again remain implicit, and this forms your ego, your conscious conception of yourself. Jaynes calls these associations parifiers, but for our purposes, we will call them connotations. We can represent this, metaphorically, like this. Take the idea of a bird. The word bird is a code, and this code refers to various ideas which exist implicitly. Our conscious conception of a bird is therefore associated with numerous unconscious connotations, and the connection between these connotations and the abstracted principle of birds is the feeling that a bird is something we know. Now in actuality, the brain divides these two components between the two hemispheres. The left hemisphere holds the word bird, while the right hemisphere holds all of the unconscious associations. We can think of this as the left hemisphere encoding ideas, and the right hemisphere decodes these ideas through its connotations. Again, the connection between the idea, which we hold in mind, and its unconscious connotations in the right hemisphere, which, if you didn't already know, is deeply connected with the unconscious, is the feeling of consciousness. Let's look at the previously examined metaphor of a bridge. Bridge is the word, and this connects to various implicit connotations, like the idea of connecting two landmasses, of binding two places that would otherwise be separate, as well as other associations, like what a bridge is constructed from, or specific bridges that you personally know. Different people have different connotations, and therefore an engineer may think differently about a bridge from someone else. Now when we take the word bridge and use it in a different context, like when I say that metaphors bridge the unconscious and conscious minds, some of these connotations are not activated, while the ones that are relevant are. This is how the idea of bridging can make sense in this sentence, because some of the connotations, namely those which make sense in this situation, are activated, and so the word bridge still makes sense in this context. Furthermore, the right hemisphere also connects these connotations with other connotations in the sentence to produce the overall feeling of knowing. For example, you are conscious of what this video is about, and your brain is making various connections between connotations which are relevant to this video, and this is what produces the feeling that you know what this video is about. The left hemisphere deals with each word that I say individually, and connects it with the connotations which are relevant to this subject, and suppresses connotations which are irrelevant. The left hemisphere also organizes the relationships between these ideas based on syntax. Thus, we can have a sense of being conscious of a very complicated idea through these connections. Our ability to understand challenging topics depends on what metaphors we use to understand them. A concept like time is actually challenging to grasp unless we use a related metaphor, like space, in order to divide time spatially. The familiar idea of space becomes the metaphor through which we get a sense that we understand time. All of our understandings of scientific phenomena are based on metaphors. We create models, which Jaynes calls analogs, of phenomena, and these models act as metaphors, which constitute our consciousness of the world. This model of the atom reveals certain aspects of atoms. A different model illuminates other aspects, but we are only ever conscious of the model since nobody has actually seen an atom with their own eyes. These models build our understanding of the phenomenon, and putting this model forth is what produces the sensation of understanding the phenomenon. The more we understand the model, the more we feel to be conscious of the actual thing. We can always substitute models if we find one that is more accurate. Better models reflect reality more accurately, but an incorrect model can still lead to the feeling of consciousness. Back in ancient times, thunder was believed to be the sounds of gods battling. This idea of gods battling is inaccurate, 
but it does produce a sensation of familiarity, as people battling is being used as a metafire to understand the metafriend of the thunder. Thus, early humans projected various metaphors in order to gain a sense of familiarity with the world around them. For most of human history, we were not conscious of the fact that the Earth was round, or that it orbits the Sun, or that the stars are actually enormous but extremely distant. We slowly became conscious of these through exploration, and there remains a huge number of ideas of which we are not conscious. But to become conscious of them, we need to build metaphors which capture their true essence. Let's apply the model of consciousness we just developed to a few examples. To be conscious of yourself is to be aware of yourself. Being conscious of yourself right now means generating a mental analog of yourself in this situation, and this mental analog stands as the metaphor for you right now. This is another feature of consciousness, the fact that we can generate metaphorical analogs quickly and then impose these upon the world in order to become conscious of it. Consciousness also always creates a narrative in which we are participating. This narrative exists solely in our minds and is what causes a sense of continuity from moment to moment as we play out the metaphorical narrative we invent for ourselves. We, or more accurately, our egos, are the main characters of this narrative, and creating this narrative is what gives us a sense of belonging to the world around us and the events in our lives. The point is that consciousness seems to be fundamentally an imaginary realm, and we project this imagination onto the real world to feel we are conscious of it. This raises several important facts about the nature of consciousness. In a sense, Consciousness is a mental, metaphorically generated hallucination which we impose upon the world. We are all caught up in this imaginary world which exists entirely in our minds and operates through language. We are only ever conscious of this hallucinatory world, but this hallucination can still give us information about the world out there. Consciousness is not the same as language, rather it is the feeling that we understand language, a feeling which is also activated simply when we look at objects and know implicitly what they are, or, alternatively, when we impose familiar ideas in order to produce the sensation that we know what they are. No matter how many metaphors I use in this video, it is unlikely that each of you will come away with the same understanding, and this is because your own experiences have provided you with specific connotations that cause you to see this video in slightly different ways, perhaps producing your own specific metaphors or examples to help you better understand all of this. It is important to remember that consciousness is always a simplification, a way to allow our minds to approach things which are complex, but which ultimately fails to capture the true complexity of the world around us. Nevertheless, consciousness gives us immense power over the world around us, as we construct better metaphors which allow us to penetrate deeply into the nature of things, including ourselves. All of the pictures I use in my videos, and the way things are arranged spatially, are all metaphors intended to produce consciousness of the subject matter. We can use consciousness to focus on a few things, and allow our minds to act with an astonishing degree of deliberate effort, as we aim our minds towards whatever it is we are conscious of. Hopefully, this understanding of consciousness can show you how it is possible to raise your consciousness to a higher level, and become conscious of the world around you to a stronger degree. Consciousness is a consequence of the metaphors we use, and using different metaphors brings out different aspects of the world. This is why taking a different perspective on things allows us to see them differently, such as when we reinterpret something seemingly evil as being morally neutral or a consequence of nature, or when we realize that a person is much more complex than they appear. Philosophy is grounded on metaphors, and using metaphors is how we can produce a deeper understanding. So the next time you are trying to explain something which is difficult to explain, Try using a familiar metaphor in order to make it clearer.